given Iran's rhetoric, given uh, the uh, you know, extraordinarily disruptive and dangerous activities of this regime in the region, it's understandable why uh, Israel is very concerned about Iran. We are too. I don't think it's permanently destructive. Uh, I think that it is a distraction from what should be our focus. And our focus should be, how do we stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon? By giving them a deal where they can continue to enrich uranium, continue to use the centrifuges, tell them 10 years from now you could do whatever the heck you want, and give them, a, 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 if they break the deal, they'll, within a year they could develop a bomb. That sounds like a good way to me. Whew. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza, former uh, AEI and Hoover Institute fellow, uh, writer, director of films, 2016 Obama's America and America, joins us. Hey, Dinesh, how are you today? Uh, good, thanks. I'm glad to be on the show. Well, it's always good to have you on. You can come on every day if you want. Um, but let me, let me ask you, uh, the, the, the whole hullabaloo, what is it about Benjamin Netanyahu that this man, Barack Obama, despises so? I, I think what we're seeing in a strange way is uh, Netanyahu, to me, is the closest resurrection that we've seen to Reagan. In other words, if there ever had been a campaign between Reagan and Obama, it would look a little bit like the showdown we're seeing now. You've got a guy who's extremely self-confident, uh, very well informed, and quite frankly, obviously a better judge of what poses an existential threat to Israel than Obama is. So when Obama patronizingly says, well, of course, we all have the same goals, the truth of it is Israel is right there. The mullahs have said, we vow to eradicate Israel and we want to get an atomic bomb. And you put those two facts together and I can see why Israel is rightfully nervous. And I can also see why they don't take a lot of consolation from, from Obama's fatuous proclamations to the contrary. What, the mullahs want to build a bomb. Uh, if Obama's right that he can dissuade them, uh, what is he offering them in return that would make them say, all right, we're going to happily give this up? Well, obviously, and they're not going to happily give it up. And, and that's, the, that's, that's the thing. It would be one thing if we had to say, ah, oh, how's Obama pulling this magic off? There's no magic. He doesn't pretend that there's magic. Because Benjamin Netanyahu was coming, on the day before, Obama had to go to Reuters, do an interview, and reveal the one-year breakout and the 10-year end of deal. This is a precarious situation for Israel, I believe, because, you know, Israel, going back to the 1940s, had a lot of friends in the world. Uh, the Europeans, for example, were very active in the establishment of the Jewish state. But, but the Europeans, for the most part, have become alienated from Israel, and America has been Israel's one stalwart ally. But now the Israelis look to our side, and to their dismay, they see Obama. And so I think from the point of view of Netanyahu, the, the troubling fact is that he faces now two challenges. One is the Iranian mullahs, but on this, the second one is the liberal Democrats in the U.S. Congress and Obama. Yeah, very good, very good point. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, Hillary Clinton and her, uh, the revelations that are coming out. It seems like one after the other. First, we learned after we were told that she did not take, uh, that the foundation did not take any foreign donations when she was Secretary of State. Then we found out they had a deal with the Obama administration that they could keep getting donations from countries who had given in the past. Then we find out, I think from the Washington Post, that they had another country in there that, that was not one that, that had previously donated, which violated this agreement. And then we find out all her emails, she used a personal email address. Today we find out that she owned the server, she ran the server, it was in her house. Um, I mean, this is just crazy. Does any of this stick? Does any of this result in people on, on, in the media on both sides saying, you can't be president, how can we trust you? Well, I think what we're seeing here is that over the past uh, really eight years now, um, the, uh, the administration, uh, Hillary, this would also apply though to Harry Reid, most of those guys feel that because they are lawmakers, they're somewhat above the law. 
So here's Harry Reid taking money from his campaign program uh, and, and, and using it to spend on his daughter or his granddaughter's wedding. Uh, here's Hillary maintaining private accounts, receiving money from foreign governments. The Ob uh, there's a kind of lawlessness that seems to be at large here. And the real question is that at some level, will, the, will this party and will this government be held democratically accountable for that? Or is this going to be now seen as part of the way of doing business in America? By the way, I come from a country, India, where this kind of lawlessness is pervasive. But I thought one of the special things about America is that here, the same people who make the laws have to live under the laws. They don't get special treatment. Uh, and that was, that's what seems to be at stake here. And, 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 and all right. So, so when, when, I mean, are the Republicans savvy enough to, to drum this home? I mean, you know, I'm, wait, I'm waiting for Hillary to come out and her, her answer to all this email stuff will be, what difference does it make? Because it seems like, you know, that's the, it's a shrug. No matter what the lawlessness, as you put it, no matter what the scandal, no matter what the question, no matter what the situation, no matter what her culpability, it's, it's what difference does it make? I think that's because we are living in an abnormal time in American politics in which um, because Obama's the first African American president, he's been wearing a de facto halo. And that means that even if, um, even if incriminating information comes out, uh, there's a tendency to ignore it, to suppress it. Obama knows that. And so it makes, uh, it makes him, in a way, more confident, more cocky that he can get away with it because so far he has. Uh, Hillary, I think, will probably expect the same immunity because she'll be running as the first woman aspiring to be president. Uh, and so maybe she thinks that the halo will transfer to her. All right, let me ask you, uh, Ben Carson uh, today you know, the media is jumping on this. Uh, he, it's his opinion that you're not born gay. You, are, you become gay by choice. And, uh, you know, we've seen, uh, remember, Anne Heche and Ellen. Anne Heche all of a sudden decided she was gay. Then guess what? She just decided she wasn't gay. They've never found a gay gene. Uh, so Ben Carson, who's a neurosurgeon, one of the finest neurosurgeons, the pediatric neurosurgeons in the world, uh, said that, hey, jail is proof. A lot of people go in straight, come out and say they're gay. So it's a choice. What do you think? Well, I think here there's, this is a case where, where really both, both things are true because we're talking about, uh, number one, an orientation on the one hand and, the, and, and conduct on the other. Uh, we can even step aside from homosexuality and look at anything else. Look at something like aggression. I mean, obviously, there are some kids who are inherently more active, more aggressive, if you will. Now, that aggression can be channeled in one direction or another, but what you do with it, what you, with the, what you act upon it, um, is is a case of of, of us choosing so, what so you so you agree with you agree uh, Dinesh we're out of time so you agree with Ben Carson to a degree it's half and half in your view it's genes and environment and choice both all right thank you Dinesh the panel's next